Welcome everyone to Epic Encounters. I hope you enjoy this week's message. I'm confident that the message from this series will meet you exactly where you are. Stay tuned for an epic journey. The book of Luke, the seventh chapter, verse number 18. And don't mind me, I'm reading from the King James uh, slash NLT slash uh, voice application slash the message version slash the Del Cerro version, amen. <laughs> But it all works and it comes together. Come on up here closer, Zaya, please. I don't bite, not in front of everybody, amen? The ride home is a different story. Luke, the seventh chapter, verse number 18 goes a little something like this. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything Jesus was doing. Uh -huh. They were up there ear hustling in the street about what Jesus was doing. Can, can we stop right here? Whether you know it or not, people have eyes on you at all times. I believe the scripture says the eyes of the Lord go to and... Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and so John called uh, for two of his disciples. He said, come here, since y'all been out there looking and ear hustling on what Jesus has done, I, I, I got a favor for you. I got a small uh, assignment. And he says, and... And John sent them to Jesus to ask him, I want you to ask Jesus this question. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? Believe your King James Version says, are you him or should we look for another? Mm -hmm. In verse number 20, John's two disciples found Jesus and said to him, John the Baptist sent us to ask. Are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we look for someone else? Are you the one, or should we look for someone else? Are you the one, or should we look for someone else? From, from that question, from that thought, I, I'd like for a couple moments to deal with uh, uh, this chapter uh, verses 18 through 23. We'll get into that later, but I want to deal with this thought for today. Today, I want to I want to deal with doubt. Today, we'll be dealing with doubt. It's only a must as we speak up the life of the faith warrior himself, the 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 faith ninja. Ray Little, we, we, we need to deal today with faith, but, but you can't talk about faith until you deal with doubt. Deal with doubt. Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, every superhero has a villain. Uh huh. Superman has Lex Luthor. The Avengers have Thanos. Uh huh. Batman has the Joker. Uh, Tom has Jerry, you know, this. but everybody has a villain. And, 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 and I got to tell you that for every believer in the room, for every human, excuse me, being in the room, for every human being, the, the biggest villain for every human in this room is time. That is our enemy today. That is our number one villain. And in spite of what the Rolling Stones said, Time is not on our side. Yes, it is. Time is not on our side. Now, for every believer, the biggest enemy for every, every faith-filled believer is doubt. The D word. Because at the end of the day, when I look back at my life and I start to retrace my footsteps, I, I, I can look back and say there were times in my life where I had to use the D word. There's a, times in my life where I can say I literally didn't give a doubt. <laughs> I was confronted with doubt. And instead of letting doubt out the back door, I allowed doubt to sit down at the coffee table. And uh, I should have kept driving, but when I saw doubt, I unlocked the car door and let him get in the back seat. I, I should have let go of doubt, but instead of let going doubt, I stayed up with it all night. And I, I began to have conversations with it. And, and I began to text back and forth with doubt. I got to be honest. Got to be one hundo. I've let doubt hang around too long. 
Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, but doubt stayed around longer than what it needed to. Am I talking to myself today? And so we look at doubt, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, just because my current situation or current crisis is what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't point to where I'm going or what it will be. I like how Omarion and Chris Brown said it. Uh, what it is now, my current crisis, is not what it's supposed to be. You feel what I'm saying, OG? It's not what it's supposed to be. What's, what's going on now is not what it will always be. But I thank God that even though I doubt, God ain't tripping on my doubt. Love it because, because here it is when we doubt and we, we deal with doubt and we wrestle with doubt and we, we fight with doubt. This is what I've noticed. And can I just be transparent about my life? I noticed that I, I actually spend more time sticking up and defending doubt than I do, def, than I do fighting against it. Can I, I, I like to justify my reason for doubt. Well, well, well I, you know, you can't trust all of those people. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Uh-huh. You got to watch yourself because they like to stick stuff over here and and, and and what what does it look like them giving a job to somebody uh, uh, like me how is that person how is anybody ever going to love someone like me that's been through recycled relationships not other relationships but recycled relationships how can somebody we do more to defend our doubt than we do to fight our doubt off this is what I love. I love it because, because God stands on his word and says, essentially this, if, if faith can move mountains, then, then faith can move doubt. If faith can move mountains, watch this, y'all, then faith can move your A1C1 a little bit lower. If faith can move mountains, then I, I think I can trust God to move my credit score. Come on, y'all. I'm here to tell you today, faith has feet. So I'm here and just I want to take some time and I want to talk about our our central character here today, our main character, John the baptizer or John the Baptist, as we uh, like to call him. There's some things you need to know about John. First of all, John is the second cousin of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the first prophet identified in the New Testament, but at the same time, he's also the last prophet of the Old Testament. Some would even say this, uh, Bishop, that the first, that John is known as the first pastor of the New Testament because he was able to lead a flock and he had a message of hope saying that the kingdom is coming, baptizing people in the river. Some would say that he is the first one, but, but John's ministry, I, I work for a company called Caterpillar. We, we specialize in building what we call earth moving equipment there are tractor trailers watch this y'all there are tractor trailers the size of this room it's not an exaggeration y'all they're as tall as about three three stories high and we call that big type of equipment we call that earth moving equipment that's what john the baptist one was john was a bulldozer for jesus christ he had to clear out the path he had to move the dirt out the way. He had, to, he had to move obstacles out the way. Why? Because the kingdom is coming and we don't have much time left. Love it. Jesus calls John the Baptist, says that he's a, the greatest prophet that ever lived. Adam, I had a problem with this. He says that John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets. He said all. Of all the prophets, that, that the word there, Dave, a uh, 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 greatest is mega in Greek. Essentially, it means that John the Baptist was the largest, loudest, and mightiest of all the prophets in the Bible. And, and that's where I have my first issue with the text today. Jesus, how can you call John the Baptist the mightiest, the loudest, the greatest, 
the mega prophet, the largest one in all of history. When I, when I look at John the Baptist and I look at comparisons to him and Elijah, John the Baptist has never resuscitated a little boy. I, I, I look at John the Baptist's life and, and John the Baptist didn't do what Elijah did and, and killed leprosy. He was the first Kaiser Permanente, y'all. Uh, uh, when I look at John the Baptist's life, John the, ba John the Baptist wasn't like Mel Kesedek where he just walked off the earth in the middle of a conversation. I, I, how can you tell me that John the Baptist is the greatest of, the, of all the prophets that were ever in the Bible? When I look at the history of John the Baptist, all he did was eat bugs and had matted hair. And that's when the, the Lord shook me and essentially this, what makes John the Baptist mega of all prophets, what makes John the Baptist the greatest of all prophets is essentially this, John found the key from one portal into another. John was able to skip from one life into another. John found the secret when he started baptizing people in the Jordan River. Essentially, when Elijah brings you back to life, you still come back as you, nasty you, sinning you, fornicating you, lying you, cheating you, homosexual you, backsliding you, uh, cussing you. He, you still come back as the same person. But John says, I can get you to die and live at the same time. That makes him mega of all the prophets. That's what makes him mega in all the prophets. Y'all ever seen the show, the reality TV show that says it's called Wife Swap? Uh, I like to think that John the Baptist uh, was the first reality television show. He did a show what I would call Life Swap. Y'all gotta, you should have clapped your hands for that. I, I had picture when I said that in the shower, I would get a louder applause to that, but anyways, amen. <laughs> but here in our text today, John has confronted Herod of Antipas. And he confronts Herod because he's immoral. He says essentially this, you can't be sleeping with your brother's wife. Said it looks bad, oh God, there's a word in that. It looks bad in the kingdom. Royalty shouldn't act like that. I, I gotta preach over here. Uh -huh. You look bad to our people. He's thinking about Jewish people. He's thinking about Hebrew people. He said that that's a bad look on our people. We're not an incestual people. No, no, no. That, that's not what me. That's not what we do. We're, 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 we're not a perverted people. Uh-uh. We don't get down like that. You're putting a bad name on God's people. And God started to get with me on that one. And he said, Shante, what is it that you keep doing in your life that's giving God's people a bad name? John says, you can't live like that. And this is the part that gets me. Because John, like most of us that have a word from the Lord, we have diarrhea in the mouth and constipation in the brain. We suffer from a rare, rare disease called put your foot in your mouth disease. And so John the Baptist is here, but he's thrown into prison. And this is the part that messed me up. Nobody going to preach this to you, but, but this is the part that messed me up. Because John knows how to open his mouth, but doesn't know when to close his mouth, he's now got to do prison time and be bound. I'm preaching already. Because John knows how to open his mouth, I'm preaching to myself right here, but doesn't know when to close his mouth, he's found himself into something that now he can't get out of. Can I just say this? God didn't put John the Baptist in prison. Mm -mm. God didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did not put John the Baptist in prison. John the Baptist is serving time at the Hebrew Sing Sing prison because essentially John is like most of us. He don't know when to close his mouth. I need you to see where I'm going with this. 
He's now got to do with a stint, oh God, with a stint of bondage because he opened his mouth and didn't know how to shut it. Uh, you know, I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm feeling kind of squ squeamish because I feel like the text is talking about me even though it's for you. Amen. Uh, he sit here and, and what happens as the story goes is that uh, while he's in prison, Herod Antipas throws a birthday bash. Throws a birthday bash for himself and decides to have his niece come on out and jump out of the birthday cake, y'all, and, and do some dance. And this is how we know it was an inappropriate dance because there were only men in the room. And, and, and culture, history and culture shows us that if men were only in the room and, and you were dancing like that, it had to be for an inappropriate reason. And so while he's in there and he's getting his birthday, Dan, and, and homegirl is, is shedding her modesty uh, uh, to him, he begins to allow her to work on his heart and begin to, begin to tamper with his mentality. And he had to eventually come up off the ones, y'all. He had to make it rain because it was, it was a good dance, y'all. I don't know what she did, but she must have twerked real good that night, y'all. Because he asked, he said, eventually, he said, whatever you want, I got you, old girl. Whatever you need, I'm willing to take care of you. That must, Lord, thank you for the power of the twerk, y'all. Uh, <laughs> sits there, and, and what eventually ends up happening, her mom gets in her ear and says, give me the head of John the Baptist. And this is the part we got to pay attention to. Because the only way to shut up the prophetic voice in this era, you must chop the head off of the prophet. In order to close the prophetic voice of this generation, you got to take off the head of the man of God. And everybody is here and, and we don't understand how the voice of the world is trying to silence the church. The voice of the world is trying to silence every believer. But, but I got to tell you, I got news for you. I'm not ahead of the church. No, no, no. I'm just an employee, amen. I'm getting a W-2 from the church. Uh, God is the one that fills out the 1040. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, not the preacher, amen. So he's sitting here and it gets to our, our key text today. John is here on death row. And John is about to die. They've already given him his date. They've already offered him his last meal. They've already offered him whatever movie he'd like to watch since it's his last week on here. And while he's on death row, he's reflecting on his life work. And he, he's reflecting on everything that he does. And he, he says, essentially, guys, I need you to do me one favor. Go find my cousin, Jesus and tell him, is it you or should we look for someone else? And this is what gets me because you don't see it on the undergird. But what's interesting is here we have Jesus calling John the Baptist the greatest of all the prophets. John the Baptist, which some would say is the first pastor of the New Testament. John the Baptist. John the bulldozer Baptist is here in prison, yet he admits he hasn't seen Jesus. Prophetic voice from God, preacher of the good news, yet he admits I haven't talked to God. And as Chris history records, John has been in prison now for over a year. He said it's been a year since the last time I talked to Jesus, I'm preaching already. It's been a year since the last time I had a conversation with Jesus. It's been a year since Jesus and I have been in an intimate setting. It's been a year since Jesus and I have touched one another. It's been a year since the Lord and I have embraced one another. I've been preaching, but it's been a year. I've been prophesying but it's been a year. I've been doing the work of God, baptizing people, ministering to folks in jail, but it's been a year since I've reached out to Jesus. 
God said, tell my people, we don't need any more John the Baptist situations. Don't let it be another year before you talk to me. Don't let it be another year before you reach out to me. Don't let it be another year before you touch me. Don't let it be another year before you and I sit in an intimate setting. John's in prison for over a year. And he's sitting there and the whole time he's there, even though he's the greatest of all the prophets, John is sitting here now and he's struggling with doubt. Which lets me know this. Essentially, if you haven't heard from Jesus in over a year, if you've ever spent some time away from Jesus, it gives a slither of an alley for doubt to creep in. Sitting here in this situation. And he's there and Jesus says, and this is the problem that he has. John the Baptist has this problem uh, with scripture, essentially, Jesus, I'm, I'm hearing about all the things that you say you can do, Jesus. I've given up my old life for you, and I've taken on serving you and preaching about you. But, but when I look at my life, I'm wondering, how can I be in a situation that you say that you can do, but you won't undo? Come on, I'm talking to you now. I'm in this situation. And as I look through all these books, you're telling me to have faith. You're, you're, you're telling me to hold on. You're telling me to hold out. You're telling me to wait for the surprise. You, you, you're telling me to wait for the blessing. And, and, and I'm here, but my situation is not removed. John sits here, and, and now he's getting uppercut right now by doubt. It's, it's working on him, and it's it's wearing him down. You, you've been shooting your mouth off, God, about how serving you is better than anything that I could do in my life, but I haven't heard from you. He's sitting here, and he feels like I'm, I'm, I'm the gimmick of, of a bad infomercial. You know those infomercials that come on at night. You see all that stuff, but, but somehow when you order it off of, the, off of the food network, when you order it off of the shopping network, it never is what it appears to be. <laughs> Sitting here, Lord, and, and I got needs. You, you, you're doing commercials about the kingdom coming. You've, you've given me a message that you're about to show up, but I don't see you. It reminds me of, of going to Popeye's, and they tell you that the new chicken sandwich is good until you pull up, and in the drive through you see a sign that says, we're out of chicken sandwiches. John the Baptist felt like that. Don't be promoting how good you are, but when I need you, you're sold out. Come on, y'all. So, yeah, you have the power over the world, but you have the power over the world, Lord, but why don't I feel like I'm going anywhere? Anybody ever felt like that? He has all power. He has all strength. But I feel like I'm not going anywhere. I feel like I'm not getting healthier. I feel like I'm not getting richer. I feel like I'm not getting better. I feel like I'm not getting nicer. I feel like I'm stuck in a prison and I'm not going anywhere. I even stopped arguing and then going out at night like she told me to, but I don't see nothing getting better in the relationship. I stopped cheating so that she'll get me, get my trust back and my honor back with her, but she still wants to check my cell phone and my drawers when I come home. Nothing getting better. I stopped being promiscuous and even though I stopped being promiscuous, even though I stopped smashing random men and random women, Women, I'm still single at the end of the day. If you have all this power and I'm doing everything that you told me to do, why am I still stuck in my prison? You know, I said, I, I got to know this. But in here we see the three reasons for John's doubt. First of all, John doubted because Jesus was here fulfilling. Watch this. God got me on this. Fulfilling the messianic miracles and prophecies. Jesus is out there doing the work. People are getting healed. People are getting delivered. People are getting set free. But the whole time Jesus is performing miracles. John the Baptist is in prison. Thus we have the first reason why some of us deal with doubt. 
I've never seen a miracle performed in my life. This brings me to the other question, John the Baptist. You've been preaching about a savior. You've been preaching about the power of God, but yet you've been preaching about something that you've never seen with your own eyes. Come on, y'all. You ever been there? You tell it everybody at work how good Jesus is. You tell it everybody in your family how they need to get saved and delivered like you. You tell it everybody in your community how good he is. Yet we find ourselves preaching and speaking a gospel of stuff we've never seen before with our own eyes. Thus, he's dealing with doubt. The next thing he deals with, the next reason for his doubt. It's in Isaiah 61, Brykeia, verse 1. The part that got him messed up the most was when he looked at his life, he stuck. Because scripture says, Jesus, that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. Check, I see that happening, Lord. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted. Check, I see that happening, Lord. And to announce to the captives that they will be released and prisoners will be free. I said, uh-oh. John the Baptist is stuck because I've seen everything else happen. And I know the last part of that prophecy is you're supposed to free prisoners and I ain't been paroled yet. And so now God, John is messed up because I've seen you do all these things, Lord, but yet you haven't stepped in to deliver me. At the end of the day, Lord, you ought to do it for me for no other reason. I'm your blood. We cousins, Lord. Can I at least get the family hookup? I understand when you don't want to step in while Peter is being beheaded. Come on, y'all. I understand when you don't want to step in while Paul's being sacrificed. I, I, I understand when you don't want to step in while they're stoning Stephen, but I'm your cousin, no, Lord. We blood, blood. Blood in, blood out. Third reason. Sitting here, Lord, he said, he said Cicely, it is. I'm looking around. Folks can see that have been blind for years. Folks are now getting EBT that haven't eaten in years. But I'm still stuck in here on cell block one. I'm still here bound. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like everybody else around me gets the blessing, but I'm still stuck here feeling bound? Lord, I took on your name in baptism. Lord, I took on your indwelling of your Holy Spirit. We're blood. The blood covers me. We're family. But everybody else is getting blessed while I'm still bound. He sits here. Essentially, we get to the third reason why John is dealing with doubt. And I see us in the text. It's because most of us like John the Baptist, have been waiting on Jesus to get his revenge against people we don't like. Imagine John being in prison cell, and he's been preaching the whole time against Pharisees and Sadducees. John's message in context went like this. When the Messiah gets here, I'm paraphrasing y'all, Y'all going to get yours. When, when the Messiah gets here, when God's kingdom comes, oh, he's going to break all of y'all off. When, when God gets down, when he, he touches down on Jewish terra firma, he's about to set it off. But now he's in prison, and they're giving him a date for his death row sentence, and he's saying, Lord, I need you to start getting back at these Negroes at any time. Lord, I need you to start going off on these people at any time. Lord, you can perform the James Brown ministry, the big payback, y'all. You can do it at any time. But he sends a message to Jesus, his second cousin. Not only does his second cousin take his time with responding, but his second cousin don't even show up. I wonder who here is pissed right now because you look at the prosperity of the wicked. 
you've been holding out and, and that's what you use to inspire you is I ain't even gonna trip on them I'm gonna let God get them but what do you do when God does nothing what do you do when you look around and my enemies are getting blessed like I like I wish I was my enemies are getting new cars while mine is getting repossessed my enemies are getting new jobs while I'm losing my job my enemies are finding new booze even though I just got divorced sitting there and he's messed up because when are you going to finally get back at the people that I thought you were going to get back at well see there now it tells us why we're serving God for all the wrong motives God says I got to let you sit there John because I don't want you to think that you're serving me because I'm going to get back at one of the people that hated on you that's not why I came that's not why the son of man shows up folks around you are getting blessed folks around you got perfect teeth folks around you got good health care folks around you are losing weight help them lord <laughs> folks around you are actually come on looking better than you do right now you look all bit of 56 and they look oh lord they look like they're going on 39 and that's when the lord dealt with me on this one day Doubt is like dementia because it has the ability to make you forget about all things that God has done for you. Even though he's the greatest of all the prophets, even though he's John the bulldozer, the baptizer, he still forgot about all the good things that God did for him just because God didn't show up for the thing that he needed. Luke, the 21st chapter right here. Luke, the 7th chapter, verse number 21. I got it for y'all. At the very time, Jesus told his disciples, come on over here. They walk in. Catch this in scripture. They walk in on Jesus while he's healing people, while he's casting out evil spirits, while he's restoring sight to the blind. He tells his disciples, y'all just saw what I did right now. Y'all like that? Y'all saw what I did. You got a front row seat at my own revival. He says, go back and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached. Blessed are those who don't fall away because of me. John, the Baptist, he had to look at that because he was looking at Jesus. Yeah, y'all, his second cousin with a limited scope. He was looking at him the wrong way. And God is sitting here and he, he wants to show some of us how, how selfish we can get sometimes. And he's sitting here and he says, I, I, I need you to remind John that even though he hasn't got out of prison yet, everything else in the prophecy is being fulfilled. God, God started to deal with me on a personal level. God said, don't, don't trip on John being mad. Why? Because John got to see the first miracle performed. I said, Lord, you got to talk to me. What do you mean John the Baptist got to see the first miracle ever performed? God, John the Baptist got to see more miracles than anybody else in the New Testament church. What are you talking about, Lord? And that's when the Lord took me to what happened between him and his mother. Elizabeth he said don't you know John the Baptist was the first to receive the Holy Ghost he got it while he was still in his mother's placenta said I never cheated John John got his I came to preach to some people to let you know God ain't never cheated you you got yours you're here breathing you're here with your baby's mind right you're here walking on your own two feet you're here and you didn't have to crawl in here today you're here and you didn't have to rob steal you're not still strung out you're not still having to be terrified by the rapist at night God said I never cheated you Tell John to look at his life. And if John looks at his life, he'll see he was the first to get broke off with a miracle. God says, I've never cheated any of y'all. I've never cheated anybody. 
because 100,000 of you didn't make it. I never cheated any of y'all. Well, it started out with 100,000 of y'all, but you were the one that made it. You came in this world as a miracle. Yes, sir. Amen. So then, Lord, how do I deal with doubt? God just showed me today. He said, remind my people, even though they got to deal with grief, even though they got to deal with hurt, even though Ray is no longer here, I never cheated any of them. Audit your life. The Lord told me, he said, Shate, audit your life. Everything that could have happened didn't happen. Everything that was supposed to happen, you barely, you narrowly missed. Everything that was going to happen, I stepped in and said, that's good enough. Said, tell my people today, I never cheated any of y'all. The reason you were able to experience the life you have is because I blessed you. Sylvia, the reason why you're able to be the world traveler is because he blessed you. The reason, Jordan that you're here instead of still in Sharp Hospital is because he blessed you. He said, I ain't never cheated none of y'all. You're here because I checked everything out. See, 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 see God is, Jesus understands that, 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 that you can't dismiss all of me. Watch this, I got a word from the Lord. He said, tell, tell my people this, you can't dismiss all of me just because a part of me doesn't show up. Come on, y'all. Did you catch that? Just, Catherine, because the healer doesn't show up, you still can't say you ain't been a provider. You still can't call him a bad lover. Uh, uh, just because the provider didn't show up, you still can't call him and say he's not the mind regulator. You still can't say that he's not the keeper of my soul. You still can't say that he hasn't been good to me. Why? Just because a part of me doesn't show up when you need me to show up. He said, John, look at Isaiah 61. I check all the other boxes. I came to preach to you today to let you know I don't care what you're frustrated about. I don't care what you're angry about. I don't care what you're disappointed with God about. But God says, forget everything that I didn't do. I check all the other boxes. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He said, I never cheated any of y'all. Tell John the Baptist, I never cheated him. He was, the, he was the first to get to experience the miracle working power of the Holy Ghost. Truth be told, John the Baptist, <laughs> you were my guinea pig. Come on, y'all. You were my test sample, uh-huh. You were my lab rat, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I never cheated anybody. God just had me look there. How many of us have confused or have rejected all of God because we didn't get the part of God that we wanted? Can I say it one more again? How many of us have rejected all of God because we didn't get the part of God that we wanted. God said, I ain't never cheated you. I ain't never cheated you. Parents, look at your children. I ain't never cheated you. Parents, when you, adults, when you go and clock back into work on Monday, I never cheated you. When you get in your car today and your car starts, because mine didn't this morning, y'all help me. I never cheated you. When you can go home tonight, uh-huh, lock the door behind you and sleep and snore as loud as you want to. Slobber on the pillow as much as you want to. I want you to remember that you're in a bed that I provided you with. You're in shelter that I provided you with. I never cheated you. How do I deal with my doubt today? I need to remind myself He's never cheated me. He checks all the boxes. He checks all the boxes. It, 
I'm going to turn it over to Bishop and let him do the altar call real quick. But uh, there was something interesting, you know. Um, pulled up, I was a little aggravated because <laughs> nobody told me it was going to be a soccer game today. And, and Bill Brown, we, we finally got the shot that we wanted with the parking lot off field, amen. It just ain't with our people, amen. <laughs> right, did you, did you go take a drone shot? I said, we're going to bless you real good today then, Bill. It's aggravating. I'm, I'm calling the administration. I'm calling the pastor. And I'm, I said, what's going on, man? You, you, you failed to tell me that you got a soccer game going on today. And, you know, and you know me, the, the sarcastic. You play, Josh. The sarcastic man said, you know, how come you didn't let the soccer game go on during your service? Come on, y'all. But I could have been angry. And could have just said, you know, we just going we just gonna move churches. Everybody, uh, let's let's have let's 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 hug each other and shake hands. Let's go home. Give an offering to go home. But but the Lord had my mind check on the pros- on the positives. And, and to be honest with you, the more I thought about it, I'm like, how else are we gonna get this many people to one place at one time? And Lord, if a soccer game <laughs> is the answer to a prayer to give us people coming to the building where we worship at. Then Lord, I need to look at the positive side of this. They might have just saved us some time doing outreach. Come on, y'all. You know that. We don't have to walk the street. We just walk behind the building. Come on, y'all. I had to look at the boxes that were being checked. We got people on site. Come on of all different flavors. I like that, y'all. I like that. <laughs> got children here. I like that, y'all. We got children. Well, did you have to work to get them? No, it was just, you, you did it through a scheduling conflict. I wouldn't have thought to do that, Jesus. <laughs> y'all, he checks all the boxes. I ask that you bow your head right now. Hello, we want to thank you for watching this segment. We would like to hear more from you. Please follow us and connect with us via social media outlets. We want to offer you an opportunity to partner with us. We can do more together. Below is the information on how you can be part of bringing this message from our community to yours. And before you leave, take our model with you. More compassion, fewer complaints.